this year I've been with the Delta State Department. Um, we have this meeting every month on the third Thursday, except that next month in December we will not because we tend to have uh, pretty low attendance between the cop and, and the holidays. January we'll be back with John Matthews, who is with the Agua, which stands for the Global Water Alliance. It's a word of the year. Um, and then in February, I believe we're going to have University of Arizona, who did an evaluation study of a climate service project that um, AID supported in Jamaica. <clears throat> and March, uh, I don't think they've updated yet. Right. Um, so, again, thank you for coming. Uh, today we have Ari Nabidoff with Earth Networks, who's going to talk about some work he's done primarily in Africa on early warning systems. And we are also privileged to have a few of his colleagues. Thanks very much, John. Well, thank you very much for coming out on uh, this rainy day and uh, hope to make this um, as uh, engaging as uh, some of the other sessions that I've attended have been in the past. Um, we're going to talk about um, things that, um, I, you know, from our point of view, are um, a part and parcel of that. Um, of course, um, um, I'll summarize um, what we have been uh, doing in, in um, these developed countries, and then um, we'll, uh, we'll definitely have um, the majority of the time to have a discussion. Um, certainly, there is uh, no one way to Really um, appreciative of any sort of feedback and also any sharing of um, your own sort of um, uh, best practices uh, in this forum. Um, so the um, I'll start a bit with the uh, context and, and really what we focus on because climate climate change uh, as a topic is so broad and uh, um, in many ways controversial. But um, you know, we uh, we have uh, really focused. On a couple of areas where we have found that we add a lot of value um, in kind of practical terms as a um, uh, climate and weather technologies uh, specialist. So, um, what, what I'm uh, showing you now, uh, this is not meant as uh, informational, this is really for context. Uh, we um, certainly um, in the IPCC uh, reports contain a whole lot of. Um, what, what I do want to point to, uh, uh, time and again, you see a number of specific types of climate-induced hazards uh, that come up in those reports. And um, so we're talking about um, uh, things that are not necessarily on climate scale, um, perhaps not even on synoptic scale. Uh, we're talking about mesoscale uh, types of First and foremost, um, severe weather. Severe weather has impacts on the ground. Uh, we're talking about heavy rains, high winds, hailstorms, um, lightning strikes, things that really uh, impact economies and, and communities. Um, and uh, within that context, um, you know, we're looking at uh, an increase in these types of phenomena. And of course, um, within the context of least developed countries, um, those are the most vulnerable to this type of um, hazard. Um, so what I wanted to uh, show you next is uh, a little bit more context on the same. <coughs> um, if you turn to the insurance industry um, and you look at, uh, this is data from um, Munich Re, uh, and you just look at the sheer number of uh, natural disasters um, from 19. There are a couple of things I just wanted uh, to point out uh, within this uh, type of uh, statistical set here. Uh, one is the, of 
course, the upward slope, that we're seeing more and more of these um, in terms of the number of natural, uh, of natural disasters. Um, also note that each one of the bars is color coded, right? So um, we're actually seeing that uh, for the most part, uh, we're um, we're looking at um, an increase in meteorological and climatological events. So climatological events, of course, they're there, um, but they're not the great majority of the, of the issue. So um, within the context of climate change adaptation, there really it does need to be a, a one of the focus areas, which is the uh, kind of uh, which is uh, addressing. So um, as um, uh, certainly as uh, the CEO of our company likes to say, um, there are probably six billion people who don't have access to weather forecasts and warnings the same way that you're used to, the same way that I'm used to. Um, certainly we get information from knowing the National Weather Service and a whole lot of other sources um, in real time, right? So if something's coming, uh, phones are going to ring, you know, that isn't the case for most people in the world. Um, so uh, that is uh, both a challenge and an opportunity, um, again, within the context of climate change adaptation and resilience. Um, there are also a number of uh, what we will term kind of um, weather uh, sensitive industries, right? So those uh, whose operations and also uh, people are uh, directly impacted by the same types of Um, just a couple of notes about uh, Perth Networks. We, uh, we're the folks behind the uh, consumer brand of web service called WeatherBike. So um, if, um, if, if maybe you've uh, kind of encountered us in that capacity, but really uh, we're also contractors to the federal government and to uh, NOAA and the National Weather Service. And we've taken a lot of the technical expertise to the global uh, national hydrometeorological agencies. Uh, so we're transferring Um, so now within the context of least developed countries, um, you know, that, that challenge of, of, of uh, generating real-time uh, severe weather information, uh, real-time tools for monitoring and alerting of the masses of people. Um, we have approached it through a pretty uh, kind of innovative uh, type, of, um, uh, type of program. We, uh, we focus on only innovative technologies. Uh, we are not um, in the business of, of building big, complicated systems to, uh, you know, to fulfill um, various, you know, various international obligations. We want to help governments get information to people, to industries, um, and to their stakeholders. Um, there are a number of things that I'll point out. But, um, uh, one of the key things that we have just accomplished is that we're now uh, contracted on a for the UNDP providing these services to uh, really uh, national governments uh, worldwide. Um, the framework that we uh, take on is really not a uh, sort of here's your uh, here's your equipment and uh, you know, off you go. But this is a long-term technology transfer uh, sort of partnership, and uh, you know we take into account the collection of information, the analysis of information, the delivery of information, and also the We really focus again on what we term leapfrog technologies. Uh, we're not. We're, we're trying to get to uh, work with the governments to get to the point where uh, information actually makes a difference. Um, within this uh, context, the public-private partnership that we establish and the kind of innovative technology that we deploy is meant to address challenges that the National Hydrometeorological Agencies have, and there are a lot of them. Um, if uh, any of you have uh, had the um, interaction with uh, the equivalents of the National Web Service in some of the least developed countries, uh, you'll appreciate that when it comes to budgetary um, capacities, technical capacities, uh, organizational um, sort of presence on the radar of the government, and 
even in terms of human capacity, the challenges are really daunting. And um, when you sort of compound uh, vulnerable uh, populations, um, sort of, uh, you know, this type of uh, challenged organization, and uh, climate change that's in, that's perfect, uh, that's actually um, compounding the, the issue. We really have um, what amounts to uh, a bad situation. Um, in this part of the presentation, I usually quote Dr. Ba, um, but um, I will skip this because uh, Dr. Ba is actually here in the audience. Um, uh, we're actually joined by uh, several members of uh, the NHS um, from Africa. Uh, Dr. Ba is, is here as well as Mr. Kintar and other. Uh, so I will move on and maybe give, give you an opportunity to, you know, to say what you um, would like to say. I would really appreciate that as well. So the, uh, the PPP, um, we look at um, a kind of construct that, um, you know, that basically uh, establishes innovative infrastructure for the delivery of uh, weather content, climate content, and um, uh, warnings, forecasts. Um, all of the above. Um, for that, there needs to be a framework, and uh, we um, look at it uh, in this way. Uh, first of all, the NHS um, obviously has a mandate in the country, um, has its uh, you know, owns all the information that's associated with that, um, and really takes advantage of the types of technologies that are being introduced. So meanwhile, like ours, a technology company, um, actually establishes uh, all the roles and responsibilities associated with having an ongoing data sharing and data and, and content generation type of approach. And we support the uh, National Hydrometeorological Agencies with training, with uh, capacity building, with a number of, uh, in a number of ways uh, you know, to bring them up. And finally, we have what amounts to or what we call sustainability partners, uh, basically industry, industry and NGOs, folks who need the data and folks who have the um, actually have the resources to help support this, uh, this added infrastructure and this uh, public-private partnership um, by using um, the information on a fee-for-service basis. So that is the construct that allows us to. Infrastructure, build capacity, and have a, a really good opportunity at a sustainability plan for the long term, beyond the grant period. Um, I'd like to illustrate this uh, model by just simply talking about cost. Cost is sort of what's everything, in some sense, uh, as you're trying to uh, do these types of projects. Um, and, and here's how to sort of think about it. Um, if, if the government and uh, those who support the government are the only ones uh, building all of this infrastructure, all of this IT, all of the, uh, you know, all of that. Um, the cost, uh, the cost is very high, and uh, many, many details uh, have to be uh, done right in order for this to work. Not just at the outset, but for over the long time. Um, so this is an additional part of it. Operations and maintenance, uh, having making sure that synoptic uh, uh, networks work, uh, that weather station networks work, um, operate uh, you know, and deliver the type of content that you're looking for. Um, when you contrast that with the partnership model, the, by using innovative uh, technologies and really using that partnership, using the capacities of, of the technology partner, that investment is actually rather small, and the rest of the folks who are involved in this. In, in uh, actually receiving the information and uh, helping sustain it, uh, the added infrastructure, uh, they're the ones who help share the burden and also allow for um, a long-term sustainability of this whole uh, public-private partnership. So, why do we think this uh, this actually um, works? Well, first of all, uh, we're part of a sort of vibrant global weather services industry, I don't know. I sort of highlight services, right? We're not talking about, you know, in 
instruments or you know, systems, we're talking about provision of services. And uh, if you look, it's, it's you know according to our estimates, it's a billion dollar industry globally. And uh, here are the sort of four top markets, and really approximate um, sizes. So you see, um, there's potential here uh, for uh, for industries for uh, partners uh, to actually pay for the services that uh, uh, that can be derived, and you know a, a least developed country may have a very thin slice of this pie, maybe a million or two dollars, but that's sufficient to create a, a, an operating budget. Uh, we have a lot of experience in this. Uh, I, I, for, uh, for the sake of time, I won't um, uh, detail a, a lot of it. This is one example uh, where we partnered with the uh, Space Institute of Brazil. And uh, with uh, just one type of uh, uh, key data set, which is uh, severe weather uh, information. Um, and also, uh, through this partnership, we're able to generate uh, uh, sufficient funding to operate these systems and, service, and provide these services on an ongoing basis. And that is only possible by making sure that part of the picture are uh, all the users of such information, aviation, electrical utilities, agriculture, mining, everyone. Um, in, within the um, context of these developed countries, uh, our work began in 2013 uh, with uh, our first pilot program that was meant to prove out the technology aspect of this. Um, and uh, this is where we partnered with the uh, National um, Meteorological uh, Service of DNA, and also with um, uh, with the mobile telecom Cellcom. Um, that has been uh, proven successful, even through the global crisis. Uh, everything is operational right now. Um, we're now working on a pilot program with uh, the five countries of the East African community, um, where uh, the same types of technologies um, are implemented, and the focus is on regional training and capacity building. And um, a framework for sustainability along the lines of what I was just describing as being put together um, as well. Um, and the same is the case in uh, Mozambique, down in, um, uh, in, in the southern part of Africa, and um, also importantly, the aviation industry, one of the kind of key supporters of weather and climate services, is also now working with us in Central Africa to deploy the same. Um, it works. <laughs> so we have, uh, uh, we're, what we're looking at right now are automated uh, severe weather alerts. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, what's called a proxy radar, which is uh, uh, kind of estimates of uh, rainfall intensity from thunderstorms. Um, this is an area that has no, um, uh, put it this way, no uh, extensive uh, severe weather monitoring systems of any kind. Um, but uh, this whole pilot program years now is showing uh, great results. So who is engaged in all of this um, besides uh, the private sector partner? Well, first of all, the National Hydrometeorological Agency. And uh, within the context of the World Meteorological Organization, they have a lot of um, obligations. Um, they have um, you know, um, a lot of framework agreements, um, a lot of uh, ways that they are supposed to of course, when, when you have all the challenges that we were just looking at earlier, um, that tends to be a pretty hard uh, task. So the public-private partnership is helping um, in a lot of these areas that, uh, the, um, that the NMHS is supposed to, um, is supposed to provide services. Uh, so that's, that's one of the good things uh, right off the bat. Um, also, of course, it's one thing to have uh, data that is uh, sort of either satellite-based or um, kind of global, uh, or on a time scale that uh, that is uh, you know, climatic. Uh, but uh, folks are now um, forecasters are now uh, using live, real-time data in their trainings. Um, so there are just a couple examples of uh, trainings that are ongoing in um, in all projects in which we're involved. Um, there was even a quite a large delegation that came here a few weeks ago. Um, also, the public is engaged. Uh, 
Um, and we had early results. The results are fantastic. Uh, here are a couple examples. Uh, we, of course, recognize that uh, mobile phones um, can uh, be divided into two categories, smart and maybe not so smart. Um, you know, for those uh, folks who just have a basic phone, um, here's an example from Malawi uh, where in just over a month, um, through a partnership we have with uh, Key Network International, um, we created a, a weather area in, the, um, in their information service, and over 100,000 people access that information in less than a month. Um, and half of them have opted in to receive um, an SMS alert anytime there's severe weather. So the demand is absolutely there. And um, uh, what we see uh, through uh, our discussions with mobile telecom operators is that um, they are investing into 3 and 4G coverage well beyond capital cities. Um, that mobile data is coming to just about every corner of a lot of these countries. Uh, they're investing. They want to see data traffic. And that creates an opportunity for folks to um, engage you know, with more uh, more rich, more colorful kind of content, um, something that is more geolocated um, because it's a smartphone. Uh, so the applications um, part we're working on as well uh, to bring that uh, to all of the uh, of the cities in which we work. And uh, final thing I will note that uh, this also will be published uh, from a study uh, that came out of a group um, that we're working with. Lake Victoria in East Africa, and um, there the fishing uh, the fishing communities and uh, those associated with them really confirmed that uh, you know, there really is an unmet need <coughs> for uh, for severe weather alerts, and there's actually a willingness to pay. So there's a uh, there's quite a um, there's a business impact associated with this information, and um, well, folks are willing to. Um, and finally, who else is engaged? Of course, industries. And we really think of them as, as sustainability partners. So if, if uh, you talk about climate change adaptation and resilience, um, a National Meteorological Service has uh, stakeholders in the government that, that are really climate resilience partners. Right? They're the ones who help distribute information. There's no sort of ecoservice service involved here. This is the public good side. Then there's also um, there are a lot of uh, really big businesses operating in the least developed countries. Uh, but uh, you can ask any uh, uh, NMHS, you know, are they able to provide the type of service that uh, these advanced and kind of uh, um, well-developed uh, multinationals would like? And the answer is usually no. Um, a lot of times they, they will go overseas. They will go to the United States for that type of service. They will go to Europe for that type of service. Um, so not taking advantage of what's there in the country. So providing the type of content in a way that they're used to consuming, um, in a way that they're used to, that they're willing to pay for, is a sustainability uh, model that we advocate. Um, I should note that um, a lot of the development uh, programs, um, international development programs, uh, that are focused on climate change adaptation uh, also and really, agriculture, or, or really a number of these um, types of, uh, we think of as verticals, they, um, they do need that type of information as well. So uh, we're informing, for example, the uh, Coastal City Adaptation Project in Mozambique um, and uh, a number of others um, under, uh, that are really sort of donor-funded initiatives, but they do need the, what the type of weather information uh, that these public-private partnerships are generating. Okay, so in summary, our experience um, of applying um, uh, some of the latest uh, weather technologies in some of the least developed countries uh, over the past several years has uh, taught us uh, quite, a, quite a few things. Um, I put a number of sort of general statements here uh, just to sort of uh, generate a discussion around these uh, these issues. Um, first of
first and foremost, it does take years. <laughs> so uh, uh, while the impact you know, of, of an innovation or a partnership or um, um, a project uh, that's based on technology can be great and, and you're able to see it, to have people adapt it takes a long time and a lot of resources. <coughs> And um, really, the human and te technical uh, aspects go hand in hand. Um, there are quite a number of, uh, quite a lot of programs that focus almost exclusively on technology, uh, and they're huge, tens of millions of dollars. Um, don't necessarily have the type of result that people expect, and vice versa. You know, everything's about capacity building. Everything's about training, um, but there's really not the sort of local, real-time sort of uh, uh, observational data forecasts or anything like that to use in those trainings. So the combination of the two is important. Um, one of the key things that we've done from the outset is that we've partnered with the National Hydrometeorological Agencies. I would say that's a, um, that's mandatory and uh, it's both uh, well, it's both uh, uh, challenging and uh, rewarding at the same time. So it's a, it's a, it's, a, it's something that is uh, that you will not be able to move without. Um, I'd like to point out, um, you know, some of the learnings as well that uh, uh, we have uh, we have had. Uh, we've looked at a number of other programs that are being uh, implemented right now. Uh, under the auspices of various multilateral development banks, uh, bilaterally uh, with the, uh, some of the European agencies, and um, you know, time and time and again, it's uh, uh, what we've seen is it's it's not about how big the program is and how much technology is per it purchases. It's actually the opposite sometimes that uh, yields results. So um, you know, it's uh, the fact that a program is big. It doesn't necessarily mean that. Uh, we, in this construct, we look at uh, donor funding as kind of seed capital. We look at a way to establish the type of infrastructure that will deliver on the public good as well as uh, provide enough value to the uh, sustainability partners um, and get the and get the PPP moving towards sustainability. That is all. Um, and uh, a couple other points here. Um, the baseline um, infrastructure, once it's there, anything that you're interested in uh, building on top of it, whether it's agricultural um, content, uh, whether it's uh, something that's focused on uh, particular types of um, issues in particular places, uh, that a lot of that becomes possible once that baseline infrastructure is in place. So a lot of extensions are possible um, you know, as, as an algorithm. National Hydromats. And finally, uh, regional approach. Um, uh, if you look at Africa, um, you know, working in one country on weather issues and, and not working in the neighboring countries is, is, is futile because uh, weather really knows no borders and everyone is affected uh, upriver, downriver, uh, you know, in the path of uh, various storm fronts. Uh, so, Having an approach that is uh, kind of multi-country in nature um, is certainly uh, one of the lessons that I've learned uh, with folks here. That concludes the presentation. Um, thanks very much. And um,
Hi, we have a participant, Oscar, with a question. It says, how did you get the private sectors involved, showing them the early warning system benefits or showing them the potential impact of climate change on their production? A bit of both, actually. Um, the, when it comes to the sustainability partners, uh, you know, some of them won't necessarily talk to us, right? Uh, they would much prefer to talk with the National Hydrometeorological Service about the provision of the types of services that they need, even if the services are enabled through this partnership. And vice versa, uh, there are companies um, that just think that the national hydromets are useless and uh, you know um, they would much rather talk to, to us about the types of needs that, um, that they have but you know the source of the information is the same and um, you know we uh, what we find is that among uh, the sustainability partners um, you know the big companies the mining concerns the, uh, uh, the oil and gas and aviation there's still a lot of there's not a really a recognition of the issues, and there's not really a, um, an understanding that there's a solution that is local and that is available. Uh, so overall, that just takes time to sort of get through um, uh, kind of rounds and rounds of, of, of training and, and uh, various types of explanations that really include both. I have no question. I want to add something. Please. Uh, unfortunately, my English is very low. Uh, I am Maro Madulani. I am the director of Med Service of Guinea. For eight years, I was the president of regional association uh, under World Meteorological Organization for Africa. As you know, Guinea is one of the least developed countries. We have, in this area, Africa, we have 34 uh, least developed agencies. The main challenge that we have, how we will deliver information to our community. You know that we have about 80% of our population are work in our farmers in agriculture. The traditional agriculture, because only we use rainy season for these activities. The main question that they give to the main services, when start the rainy season? How? the duration of the rainy season, and when the end of the season. Sometimes during the drought, as you know, in Sahel or in eastern part of Africa, many people died by, or by the fire. On the other hand, many odds lost all property by the, the drought and the disasters. Uh, now all the world focuses to the climate change. But under the climate, we have the weather. What happened tomorrow? After tomorrow. And maximum during the next 10 days. When we talk about the climate, we see only Ministry of Environment on Auto Department. We forget the main services. Because the main services work it, are working every time, 20 hours per day. Every time. Now the main challenge in the, the, the developing country is the problem of the infrastructure and the human uh, personnel. You know, it's to, to train a, a, a specialist is very difficult in the field of meteorology. An example that we have these two people from one from Guinea and one from Burundi, they came to train in under NOAA, National Organization, NOAA, Reserve Waters. Uh, a few years ago, during 
through the African Meteorological Conference for Ministers of uh, Meteorology, we meet some companies as Earth Network. They make a demonstration, and some countries ask to make uh, to make an experience with this company. And in Guinea, we, we signed a contract for a project, demonstration project, how to get a real uh, time, in real time information of my service, and specifically in during the stop in the field of during the storm season. And we enter, as uh, Mr. Ali shows this, some station detectors in the country. We use this uh, information to share with our colleagues from the neighbor countries, Mali, Sierra and so on, to show how the phenomena moves in the real time. It's very important for specifically uh, in, in the aviation where, where we have, we need the no casting information. Or for the fishery. Every year in my country we lost about 100 people. Now the problem, we get information from through the detectors or from Earth Network. But how we can share with the users specifically in this context? Because uh, we try to use this mobile phone because it's uh, cheapest, perhaps, uh, but it is an experience. So the problem now in our the budget arm is very, very low. It is no zero in many countries. Uh, every time we try to meet donors to explain the need, uh, the shape of the communities. Why last week I was at Mexico City to attend a plenary of uh, GEO, group of uh, air observation, air observation, and to explain how we can use the new technology in the developing countries. Because this, I know that uh, in USA, in USA, they have a program severe for using satellite for to, to map uh, the situation in, in many countries. But we have, we need the, the, the data in situ to, to calibrate, to help to calibrate the information that we, we, we collect. For the technology that we use with Earth Network, if we, we can ask a radar, radar about to three million of dollars. For that, you have to to get a very qualified personnel for operation, and every year we, you have to spend about to, uh, so, uh, some hundred. Thousand dollars for all the for maintenance. Why we try to, to use the technology uh, cheaper and to share information? I I am sorry if I <laughs> take the last Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Sure, uh, very technical question that I would love to answer uh, technically. <laughs> um, I'll try to boil it down to uh, just a couple of points. Uh, first, um, you know, there's a there's a participant in this public-private partnership that is local and that is key, and that is the mobile telecom operator. Um, we are actually um, co-siting the sensing systems right on the mobile telecom tower. So everything's intact, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, the other uh, part of it is that, yes, uh, for massive scale monitoring, of course, you would ideally have uh, many, many points. Uh, uh, our company operates thousands upon thousands upon thousands of uh, uh, automatic weather stations here in the United States. So every neighborhood has a station that always has cool or they have you know, any other facility. Um, that isn't available in Africa. What we focus on is it, um, a lot is actually substituting uh, weather radar for a special total lightning type of technology, which is remote sensing, um, but it's terrestrial. So it's, uh, it's instead of uh, monitoring water content, you know, it's looking at um, uh, lightning activity inside of thunderstorms and correlating um, between the two based on climate zones, seasons, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of sort of uh, back end uh, things that I'd love to uh, uh, share with you. Um, ideally, absolutely, um, everything that's uh, that's available from the satellite is, is, is great. Um, when it comes to severe weather warnings, though, um, you know, by the time um, you know something is noted, by the time something is um, analyzed, by the time um, uh, a warning is issued, uh, you know, easily half hour. And that's not accounting for all the human factors that happen afterward. By that time, you know, the severe weather impacts, the heavy rain, the high winds, the hail, all the sort of impacts uh, from, uh, from the type of severe uh, weather that, for example, is getting it um, a whole lot, um, way more than we do here. Um, and that, that's already passed. Um, so by connecting these real-time sensing systems, cloud computing, and then distribution, um, on mobile and on uh, kind of web-based GIS systems, we're actually able to automate a lot of that and really cut, the, uh, really increase the lead time of severe weather warnings. Now that said, that's just the technology part. You know, we're working quite a lot on the capacity building part, and um, through training, a lot of sort of interaction, um, you know, getting qualified users of this information at the And even at these um, you know, sustainability partner companies uh, that uh, also need to do real time uh, monitoring and alerting, um, that's a key focus as well. Are there any more questions online? Like, if you haven't 
set one in, please feel free to type one in the text box. Hi, um, my name is Kashba from Refugees International. Um, my question is, have you considered or are you doing programs in conflict-ridden states um, in Africa or around the world, and what are the challenges to doing that? Thank you. That, that's actually... Thank you. That's actually a great question. And um, uh, one of the um, really hardest things uh, here was the presentation of the director of neurology from the Central African Republic. Because um, it amounted to, you know, there's nothing left you know, <laughs> of everything they built. And that's, that's just terrible. Um, but how do you, you know, so how do you actually put something in place where, in, in those types of conditions? Well, once again, um, things do work in these uh, environments um, uh, on a different level. The mobile telecom operators still provide a service. Uh, they still have the uh, powers in all of these areas. Um, they're still delivering, and, you know, um, they're still able to deliver an SMS in a lot of these areas. So, um, so certainly we have um, uh, we have some examples. Um, currently, Burundi is one um, that we didn't expect to be that way. But There are, of course, um, 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 countries uh, like uh, Guinea, uh, for example, where um, uh, some of the issues uh, surrounding the Ebola crisis essentially prevented uh, a lot of people from being able to physically be there. Um, but through automation, through cloud computing, through the, through the partnering uh, with the mobile telecom operators, it is entirely possible to carry on the observation We have uh, several stations. Absolutely. But, you know, I'd be glad to give you the full detailed information on that. Thank you. Thanks. I'm Haley. Um, I'm on the Environment Project here at Telemax International. And something that Dolan from Guinea uh, brought to mind was what farmers want to know in the, the rainy season. Can I bring to my regional forecast versus more immediate yeah. um, forecasts? And I guess two parts, is the science the same behind those? And then, I mean, how do you figure in probability when you're talking longer term forecasting? Thanks. Thank you. And um, I, I do have a slide I wish I could show up on that really kind of explains the, the uncertainty and the time scales in a whole bit. But, um, you know, we, so if, if we look at climate, Mesoscale. Um, mesoscale is what we're focused on the most because we find that that is actually the gap. Um, a lot of internationally uh, driven products are available to, uh, for seasonal forecasts. And seasonal forecasts are really kind of, it's kind of a static type of information, right? Once, you, once it's there, it's updated once in a while, and it can be shared out um, very readily uh, through a number of ways, right? And once someone has it on that's what it's going to be you know, for a long time. So that makes it easy in a way. Right? So when you're talking about dynamic environments um, where you know, we're talking about mesoscale events, uh, so climate abuse hazards that are you know, happening on the scale of you know, minutes, hours, um, you know, day, and, and so on, that is, uh, that is uh, not really well covered at all. Um, you take any, not just the very well for me, uh, for instance. And so 
still would have some of the same challenges. Because from the sensor to the app <laughs> is a long road. The same thing. One same thing is uh, seasonal forecast. Uh, more than 10 years ago, in our vision, uh, we organized every year a workshop for uh, concerning the seasonal forecast. Uh, we use the result of model from uh, regional and global centers. I think that this colleague came here to learn how they can make it in our country because we have to make a don't, don't lose, don't scale. don't scale it. But the other problem that we have, uh, the last year under the World Meteorological Organization, we made, uh, every year we made a monitoring how the work of synoptic adaptation uh, in the region one Africa, the result are less than 50% of synoptic data during the year. In my country, we have about around the, the coverage of the country 250 square kilometers. We have only 12 stations, synoptic station, and uh, sometimes only five or uh, six, five, six stations work operation regularly. But if you see about uh, two, the, the distance between the synoptic station around the world, Squall, thunderstorm, uh, I don't know, but radar. Uh, yes. You, they, you, get, you cannot uh, measure this information by the synoptic because distance is very large. Why it necessary to, to use this? technology for increasing the data availability of the data. I don't know if I will ask you. But every year we try to do the seasonal forecast. We disseminate but now we, we train our farmers in the country how we use the, the data, the information, biomass information. And we follow we monitor for more than 10 applications specifically in the field of adaptation. Yes, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, I'm Foyle Andahira with the Atlas Project. Um, I was just wondering for those of us who aren't as familiar, um, who aren't as familiar with weather monitoring systems, when you were referring to some of the innovative new technologies and how they address some of the problems that the older technology or more traditional technology had, and in particular it relates to the infrastructure, and you talked a little bit about the barriers and the countries that you're working in. What are could you go into more detail about some of the characteristics of the innovation?
So those types of things are now becoming part of our world. <laughs> um, that is not where the LDC are at the moment by any stretch of the imagination. Right? Um, so uh, we, you know, so these innovations, um, you know, they really um, can play a constructive role in, in terms of getting uh, data out of a lot of areas that uh, the classical methodological um, uh, equipment, such as time and spaces, um, isn't you know, a big city central. Um, the application varies widely. Um, of course, um, on the final scale, you can make the computation of very important things. Well, the types of applications that we're talking about here in the future with ability to um, inform someone in the exact location of, of, of their exact current weather condition, their uh, potential, any potential uh, severe weather alerts, and also give them a forecast out to know the, uh, right where they are. Um, for that, you don't necessarily need so um, a lot of the observation network that we have in the state and other countries of you know, thousands and thousands of compact, um, almost maintenance free type of um, stations, their uh, density of observations, the number of points matters um, just as much as the accuracy of the data and the application of it. So um, so the innovation here is as follows. Um, these the, um, the automatic weather stations are um, orders of magnitude um, um, uh, with cost less than uh, the types of uh, systems that uh, we're looking at already monitoring. Uh, you can have a lot of them. Um, the other innovation is with multi-model forecasts, um, there, are, there are layers and layers of innovation and um, uh, statistical work and modeling and all of that. Um, it's, it's the type, it, it's really, um, but I think to me the innovation is the fact that this can actually deploy and work effectively over a long period of time and take into account the needs of areas for weather monitoring and forecasting. Really add value right where they are, um, it really changes the game. Hey, thank you so much for your uh, presentation, really interesting. My name is Michael O'Neilly and I'm with Apps Associates, I'm a climate change adaptation specialist. I've done a lot of work with small island nations in the Eastern Caribbean on climate information services for them. And I think uh, one of the points that our participant was beginning to emphasize that really can't be uh, overstated are the that many nations struggle with in terms of the capacity of their national hydrogen uh, agencies. In many of the um, small island Eastern Caribbean nations, it's one very small office <coughs> with um, just one or two staff and equipment that they have to physically drive out to once or twice a week to print information for the data center and then bring it back and process it that way. And uh, when I was there, we um, helped the Caribbean Institute of Meteorology and Hydrology establish a relationship with WMO so that, so that a regional climate information services center of excellence could be created in the Eastern Caribbean to kind of shore up some of those national capacities and help strengthen national capacities. But, you know, it's, 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 it's really important, I think, that we're talking about public-private partnerships because, of course, the private sector needs and wants accurate, reliable, robust question is, you know, what is needed to really see a catalytic scaling of private sector investment in national climate information services? Why isn't that happening right now? What, what's needed to make that happen? We're clearly seeing in the vulnerable sectors, fisheries, agricultural nations, small fishermen, you know, small farmers, and they may have less ability to pay, but even the larger industries that have more ability 
should be should be pulling money. have a question? If not, we can come to our national conclusion here. Um, so I'd just like to thank you, Ari, for, for taking the time to give us an informative presentation and leading that uh, Q&A session. Um, also, thanks to everyone here in attendance for uh, someone appropriately braving the weather to come in and attend the Q&A today and everyone online as well. Um, as John mentioned, we won't be hosting one in the, in the beginning of December. 